With the price point of the new FX30 being significantly lower than any cinema line product we've seen before from Sony, there are naturally a few key cameras that I want to compare it against, because I think customers will be trying to choose between them. The first is of course the FX3, that kind of goes without saying. But at a more similar price point, there's also the Fujifilm X-H2S, Panasonic GH6, Sony A7 Mark IV, and perhaps the one we sold the most of over the years, the Blackmagic Pocket 6K. Now the FX30 was only here for a few days, and of those cameras, only the FX3 and the Pocket 6K Pro happened to be here in the showroom at the same time. So in time, hopefully I'll be able to compare the FX30 against each of those other cameras. But for now, let's start with the FX3 and the Pocket 6K. In terms of physical feature differences, between the FX30 and the FX3, there are essentially none. The only real difference is the sensor size and the only physical impact that will have is the ability to use APS-C lenses, plus of course, a speed booster with full frame glass if you want to as well. Compared to the Pocket 6K range though, there are quite a few differences of course. There's the Pocket 6K G2 and the Pocket 6K Pro. And on current pricing, the G2 is roughly the same price as the FX30 body only, and the Pro is only slightly more than the FX30 with the XLR handle. So for the lower amount of money, the Pocket 6K G2 offers the advantages of two mini XLR inputs, RAW and ProRes recording internally, a larger screen at the back, and some more useful video tools like false color, for example while the FX30 body only is more limited on audio inputs without spending more money as there's just that MI shoe or a 3.5 millimeter input. But for some work that will be enough and there's always the option of adding the top panel, a K3R adapter or any MI shoe accessories at a later date. But the FX30 has a stabilized sensor, much more frame rate options like 4K 120p and 1080 at 240 frames a second. It has the fantastic hybrid autofocus performance. So if that is useful for your work, that is a huge advantage to the FX30. And it also has an E-mount on the front. So that means you can use a much wider range of lenses than the EF mount on the front of the um, Pocket 6K because of all the adapters you can use with E-mount. Things start to change a little once you step up to the top handle with the FX30 or the Pocket 6K Pro. So the higher price range in each range. All of those same strengths remain for each camera, but now the Pocket 6K Pro has internal ND filters, which is a really big advantage. And the FX30 gains a big bump up in audio recording, better preamps, better audio controls with physical dials and full size XLR inputs with line level control and phantom power. Plus you get a much nicer ergonomic design because of this top handle itself. So which one is right for you will depend a lot on your work and what you need from your tools. We also did a quick battery life test between the three cameras. All three cameras were recording 1080p so that the card wouldn't fill up and stop recording. Both of the Sony cameras were using a fully charged FX100 battery and the Blackmagic was using a Hawkwoods DVF590 battery. The Pocket 6K Pro died first at one hour and 13 minutes, which is not too bad really for a small camera like this. It's certainly much better than they used to be a few years ago. Then the FX3 died at two hours and six minutes, which I think is really quite impressive, especially considering it's a full frame sensor, remember? But the FX30 was still going and held out for two hours and 49 minutes, which is really excellent battery life for a small camera like this. So let's start looking at some pictures. Our time with the FX30 was very limited as this was all filmed within that small window we get with the pre-release model. So the two main comparison tests we managed to get were a regular high ISO test on a chart and this interview style shot of Kieran where we also ramped the exposure up and down in order to compare latitude. Let's start though by cropping right into each camera at 400% to see how much detail there is in each image. The FX30 and FX3 are very similar with the FX30 having perhaps slightly more detail here, but there's really not a huge amount in it at all. We filmed this test on the Pocket 6K in both Blackmagic RAW and ProRes, and you can see there is definitely more detail in the RAW footage. 
Now this is using the default Blackmagic RAW settings in Resolve. Compare this to the FX30 and the FX3, and the RAW footage is noticeably more detailed, while the ProRes is pretty much the same as the Sony cameras. This does make sense, as the RAW file from the Blackmagic is the only 6K file here. When you move to ProRes on the Blackmagic, it limits you to 4K. Dynamic range is where things get a little interesting. It's worth pointing out that these tests are not a true scientific dynamic range test. They are useful for comparing how different cameras behave next to one another, but they don't tell us a complete picture on each camera in turn. You do need something more scientific for that. So what we do is we film an averagely exposed or zero EV clip on each camera at the exact same settings in the same lighting situation. Then we raise the exposure up a stop at a time until we get to four stops overexposed. And then we lower the exposure a stop at a time until we get to four stops underexposed. Why that specific range? Well, any more would be challenging for us to do without having to use things like ND filters, which just complicates the maths massively. Plus, this is a real world example test of correcting exposure and pulling from your highlights and shadows. And having to do that for more than four stops over or underexposed is pretty unusual. So let's start with the FX30. As is often the case with Sony cameras, the image actually improves when you get up to one or two stops overexposed and then you correct it back down. It lowers that noise floor dramatically and the whole image just looks great. Above that, both three stops and four stops overexposed are completely fine. There's no clipping anywhere. It still looks great, even this far overexposed. Once you start underexposing though, things change and the noise really starts to show. And by four stops under, the FX30 is looking pretty bad. But to be fair, so are most cameras by this point. On the FX3, the results are actually quite similar. The same improvement when you start to slightly overexpose and there's no clipping at four stops over here either. On underexposure though, you start to notice the difference more between the two cameras. At four stops under, the FX3 keeps more of its original colors than the FX30 and avoids taking on quite so much of an overall magenta bias. The noise also looks very different. The FX30 is clearly doing much less noise reduction in the shadows which is something that people have been asking for from the FX3 and A7S Mark III sensor. So yes, the FX3 looks cleaner here when dramatically underexposed, but that might not actually be necessarily a good thing. Depends on the style of work you do and how you like to work in post-production. But the color differences are definitely an advantage for the FX3. The Pocket 6K Pro is very different though. It must distribute its dynamic range in a very different way than the Sony cameras, as it's cleaner in the shadows, but it badly clips on Kieran's face when it's overexposed to four stops. Here is the black magic on the left with highlight recovery mode on in the RAW controls and ProRes recording on the right. So RAW does look much better on the left there, but it's not enough to make this situation look good. In underexposure though, it is a completely different situation. This is RAW and this is ProRes. Both look much better, in my opinion, than either of the Sony cameras. So what's going on here? Well, in more scientific tests like CineD's lab tests, the FX3 and the A7S Mark III sensor does have slightly more dynamic range than the Pocket 6K sensor. However, I think these results are more to do with each gamma profile distribution of dynamic range and the limitations of this actual test we're doing here. Because remember, I have to match the settings between the cameras for zero EV, which means I choose my exposure based on one camera and then I copy it across to the others. So in this situation, in this test, I exposed the FX30 and set the same settings on the Pocket 6K. So perhaps the Pocket 6K would have benefited from being exposed a little bit lower and then we would have had very similar results between the two cameras. You know, this is the trouble with non-scientific tests, of course. They tell us very useful information, but they don't tell us the whole picture. But even so, let's look at those results side by side. Here is the regular exposure, FX3 on the left, FX30 in the middle, and the Pocket 6K Pro in Blackmagic RAW on the right. Here's four stops overexposed, with the Sonys both looking excellent and the Blackmagic unusably clipping on his face. 
and here's four stops underexposed, and you can see the colour differences very clearly with them side by side like this. The last test we did was high ISO. This is filming our chart here, raising the ISO and then raising the shutter speed to compensate for that and keep exposure levels the same. This way only the noise should change between ISO values. Let's just put all three cameras side by side with a 300% crop to see that noise. Again, FX3 on the left, FX30 in the middle and Pocket 6K Pro on the right. This time in ProRes. At 800, of course, they all look great, with the FX3 being perhaps the cleanest. And then once we move to 3200, you can start seeing the characteristic differences between each camera. The FX30 is definitely doing much less noise reduction than the FX3, and actually the noise looks quite natural, with very little chroma noise. The Pocket 6K has a slightly more digital look to the noise, in my opinion, with more chroma noise there. At ISO 6400, it's the same thing, but more pronounced. And at 12800, both the FX30 and the Pocket 6K are starting to get to the point where most people would consider not using the camera at this level. The FX30 is definitely the better of the two of them, though. Meanwhile, the FX3 still looks amazing. Even at 25600, the FX3 is still looking great, while the Pocket 6K is definitely too noisy here. Interestingly though, the FX30 actually looks quite similar to how it did at 12800, which is a surprise. So it could still be usable for some people, especially with a bit of noise reduction. Both the FX30 and the Pocket 6K have now maxed out at their max ISOs, while the FX3 carries on going, letting you select those crazy high ISO values that this sensor from the A7S Mark III is so famous for. So there we go. That is the physical differences between the cameras, the sharpness and detail, over and under exposure, and high ISO noise performance. All three are just fantastic cameras, but what do you think of the differences between them? What do you think of the pros and cons? Let us know down in the comment section. And if you want to buy any of these cameras for your own work, of course, just head over to provi.co.uk. And if you're really struggling to choose which one is right for you and your work, our sales team will only be happy to help. We have a showroom here for you to come in and try them out for yourself. So please do get in touch. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.